right. Today we got a returning guest, Mr. Tim Moon. How are you, sir? Very good. How are you, Tony? Uh, I'm doing fantastic. And you are a name that has uh, been with the show for a very long time. We've been in communication with you for a while. And uh, you were one of the earliest guests on the show. We're trying to figure out what episode exactly it was, but uh, you're you're thinking it was like around episode fourteen. I think that that for some reason that re- re- that's how, what comes to me, but I can look it up later and send that to you. If you if you could find it, because I can't even find it, but uh, if you could find it, that'd oh, be I'll, great. I'll find it. Uh, we could, uh, you know, uh, have a good time uh, sharing that episode as well when this one releases for people. But uh, nevertheless, you have been around uh, with the confessionals for a very long time. And uh, I probably didn't say your last name on the first recording because we usually don't do that. But now you are an author and you have a fascinating book that you want to share with people. Uh, and I'm excited about talking about it because I've been hearing about it for years. And so this is this is a, a great opportunity for me as well. Um, your book is called Tomato Fields, which I think is a very interesting name uh, it, because it's a book about Bigfoot. And uh, I, I'm, I'm interested to see how you came up with the name of the book and how this book all unfolded, because I believe uh, your brother ri- originally was going to be with us today, but he has to work. And he had a Bigfoot encounter that spawned the writing of this book, correct? Yeah, that's correct. It was, um, he um, had it in the, in the ni- 1990s and he had a, uh, bought some property there to build houses on in, in Mason County, Washington, just up above the hood canal hook. And, uh, he was out fixing the lights on his trailer, uh, one early, early evening. Uh, and he, he smelled something really bad, uh, and like something was dead and he couldn't figure it out because he hadn't seen anything. And so he started looking around and just up the top of the hill about, 70 yards or so by a light post he saw the animal standing there and he said that um the thing that stuck him the most was the just the sheer size of it it's it was about eight feet tall and it was almost wider than it was tall and uh, then it screamed at him it must have he, he must have surprised the the animal and it screamed at him with that typical yell that vibrates through you and he just freaked he thought he was going to get killed he didn't think he was going to make it and he ran back to the house and grabbed his shotgun and closed the front door and looked out the window of the door and he he figured it was on the way toward him and it it stopped screaming and then it turned an opposite way and walked back into the woods just a few steps into the woods at that time there was still a lot of green it's been cut now and to build houses but he was just freaked out he never seen anything he had no idea what 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 he was looking at and uh so that happened the area that happened he felt like there there's an area at the bottom of the hill if you keep going up to the top and then you go down a ways there's a place that they used to use to dump sewage and they dumped they just dumped sewage from trucks out onto the to the acreage and that sewage uh, because of human waste and seeds and stuff well a lot of vegetables would grow in the area and uh, and the tomatoes would be big and red and a lot of the animals would go there to eat the vegetables so it was kind of a habitat for animals and he got he got the idea of naming the book tomato fields after that area and so that that and his house kind of become the center of the book and it was just kind of inspired me it's not like it's much like his story but the story itself kind of inspired me to write i've been studying a lot about bigfoot for a long time and i've been had been thinking at the time i wonder if you could use fiction and do it right maybe you could draw people to this subject and kind of win them emotionally maybe if they're not ready to be one rationally because a lot of factual stuff doesn't seem to get the job (laughs) um but maybe you could reach people more emotionally through stories i think people are moved more through stories than facts so i thought well maybe we could try to do that with a book you know um 
a book about uh, something related to this. So I just made up a story related to it. Start taking place in the 70s and just called it tomato fields well i think it's a great title and um i think it's interesting how this whole thing came together with your brother's experience but did you what was your thoughts on bigfoot before your brother relayed his experience well i've always been interested in it and i've never seen one um i but since i watched as a kid i watched the creature from is it creature from bogey creek right yeah boggy creek yeah uh boggy creek and i watched that that movie had a big impact on me and it just seemed like there was something to it like it wasn't just and so i always kind of thought that it was very possible and uh so i look every time i hear a chance to hear a story or read a book or or talk to somebody i'd often talk to hunters and i would hear you know here and there that people saw it or they heard it or they they uh, smelled it and and a lot of people seem to have uh some kind of experience with it but i personally never have and um i don't want to you know make something up but but it's, it doesn't matter i i i still am very interested in it and i've studied it quite a bit so listen to thousands of stories yeah there's, there's no need to make things up. I mean, shoot, I've never seen a Bigfoot and I, my job is to talk about these things. So, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's one of those things where, uh, the fascin the fascination can lead you for sure. Um, I find oh. it, I find it interesting how you, your, your thought process and how you can kind of almost, uh, not that you're a Bigfoot activist or anything, but that you just kind of bring it to people's minds and stuff through a, a fictional story. Uh, we kind of, we, we kind of have the same philosophy and mindset here, uh, with the movie we're going to be shooting, uh, we're going to be shooting a movie, oh, good. Uh, and uh, in June actually, and um, uh -huh. it, it's about Bigfoot, and it's it's more of a psychological type of movie. It's not going to be blood and guts and gore, uh, but it's going to be you know <clears throat> very engaging mentally, and uh, I think I think there's a place for that kind of stuff for sure uh, to allow people's minds to go. That's what I tried to do, Tony. Um, I wanted to make people think and take them places where they didn't have any intention of going and come to come to conclusions that that are pretty normal for humans to do. <laughs> and so I, I hope I was able to do that. But um, and it's a little spiritual, too, because I have some characters in there that challenge make make it th some spirituality that induce some spirituality, I think so. So I hope so. Yeah, I, I think I think so. I mean, uh, Lin Lindsay uh, is a big supporter of your writing, and it's been getting great reviews. So it's it's very it's very encouraging to see the process because I, I've I've been in, we've been in community more Lindsay than me, but uh, we've been in communication with you, and we've been aware of this book coming out for a very long time, and you put a lot of time and effort into it, and uh, it's really it cool just, to see it come to fruition. Yeah, it was the first novel that I've written, so. It just, I just had a lot to learn to make it all work right. And uh, I, I think I did a pretty good job with the character development and the story and the engagement of it. I'm not as good at editing as Lindsay. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's, there's a couple of editing things, but I'm still working through that. But, um, the, but the story and the, the characters are intriguing. And people have just told me that. I'm not just saying that on my own. I'm hearing that from other people. So anyway, that was my goal. Absolutely. Uh, so let, let's let's kind of dive into the book a little bit here. And if you could just kind of okay. tell people uh, what the story's about. I mean, what's what's the, the whole storyline about? Uh, about uh, it takes place in the 70s. I wanted to do it when that likelihood of that place existing was possible. Uh, because they stopped dumping sewage and did it, started using a plant. They they don't do it anymore. So I went back to the 70s, and I also wanted to go back to before anybody knew what Bigfoot was, because it didn't that name didn't take off until the late 60s. And so I never mentioned the term Bigfoot in the book, and um, I wanted that to be part of the mystery. And so, and it's just a about a sheriff who. It finds out about 
this animal that's killing other animals and eventually fearful it's going to kill people. And uh, he and some of the people who are associated with the house that the, the, the thing first appears to, which turned is my brother's house. <laughs> His address is in the book. Um, and if it, it, then their effort, him and the deputy and some of the people, the, the neighbors there uh, try to uh, eventually get to the bottom of this and, and eventually wind up um, getting rid of the animal, but I don't want to say how. And, um, and, but the, the idea is that there's never closure. <laughs> it mm. does, it does not, uh, it doesn't close. Nobody's the same after the encounter uh, and the process of trying to resolve the conflict. And, and I liked, I wanted it to be that way. So, because there is no closure in this thing, <laughs> yeah. even if we catch one and I don't think we're going to, but even if we did, I think they actually have already, frankly, but, uh, I still think the mystery is, is way beyond just the animal himself. So I wanted to maintain that mystery. I wanted to make it so anybody who has an opinion on this, if it's a paranormal or flesh and blood or, or space alien or what, whatever they've come to the feeling that it is, I wanted them to be able to see part of their belief in the book. That's really cool. Without it, without it being, without it being a clear answer. No one can say, oh, uh -huh. it must have been this, um, because I hope not. I hope I was able to do that. So, Well, I'm, I'm sure you did. And I, again, I mean, the, listen, I mean, for somebody who writes their first book and putting it on Amazon as a self-published thing, um, and, and when did the book come out again? It, it wasn't long ago. Uh, it, it, it's been about 90 days. Okay. So 90 days and you got 71 ratings on Amazon. Uh, that is not yeah. easy to do. Uh, so I, it definitely shows that people are buying the book and reading it and thinking enough of it to go, take their time outside of reading the book to go leave a good review on Amazon. So uh, it says a lot. It's about a hundred and what eighty five, one hundred ninety pages about that. And, yeah, and it's, that's it's, about right. It's a good read for people to uh, to check out. Um, now it's interesting you're bringing this this aspect up with the sheriff and things like that. I was just out in Washington uh, myself. And uh, I was doing, we were shooting a film for uh, uh, a Bigfoot film based off of Wes Germer's encounter location. And right. we, uh, we go out there and what we do with these films is we just, we put ourselves in the environments of, you know, a known uh, epic encounter of whatever, whether it's Dogman, Bigfoot, whatever. And we just put ourselves in that environment and we document what happens around us the best we can and uh and see what happens we're not into making things out of anything uh, yeah that's good so we go out there and we you know we i have a producer joseph and he really does a good job with getting the trip organized and so we have a game plan we have people we're going to talk to we have a general game plan and from the general game plan it, it unfolds itself uh and so we go out there, we're, we're thinking, okay, we're going to kind of focus around the location where Wes had his encounter. We'll talk to this person over here that has a story that kind of supports Wes's story and different things like that. Well, we go up there. And the first day we go up there, we, we find a vehicle and this person's belongings are on the outside of the vehicle like they just got up and walked away. And uh, yeah. it, it literally was less than a quarter mile away from Wes's ground zero encounter. And uh -huh. Uh -huh. then later in the day, we came back and everything was still untouched. And we're like, okay, maybe the guy just kind of, you know, went into town or something like that. Well, it was like two or three days later, we come back up and nothing's been touched still. And that's when we're like, okay. Did you check any of it to see if he had his wallet in there? We looked in the windows, uh, doors were locked, uh, but he, okay. he, we did find a pair of shoes uh, about 50 feet away from the site. And uh, we also saw that there was a pair of shoes on the driver's side floor. So, um, yeah, it was wow. like, he couldn't have gone far. We thought, you know, it's just, you know, I, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I feel like, uh, um, uh, David Politis right now where he, he, he draws this story for you, this imagery for you, but he doesn't tell you what he thinks it is. Right. And that's, how, <laughs> that's how I feel right. like I'm in the situation right now. Uh, but right. the, the, uh, the, the fact is there's, there's a lot of people that do go missing in that specific area. 
Um, and and we unknowingly might have found uh, somebody who has possibly gone missing. And uh, and so it, it's interesting. Just the, it kind of sparked my mind when you were talking about the sheriff's involvement in your book and the the animals. Uh, because there, there is a a, le- a legal law side of these stories. I mean, people do call the police uh, on, on Wes's uh, intro for Sasquatch Chronicles. I mean, you, you hear that nine one one call. That's a yeah. that's a real nine one one call, and um, yep, it, and that's only part of it. It was actually two calls, and um, the the uh, the the other part of the the call that people don't hear is how the guy says. Something broke his dog's neck. Who his dog? His dog was over two hundred pounds. Something broke his dog's neck and threw it over the yeah. fence. Like, yeah, I I think I heard Wes say that once. So, I just heard Wes. I think I heard that on Wes's program once, and uh, that's pretty breaking a dog's neck, big dog, and throw it over a fence. That's not easy to do. <laughs> no. So I'm sure the guy was really freaked out. Yeah, I mean, you think about like a, a, a full grown man that's two hundred pounds. Are you going to pick him up and just throw him over a fence? No, no, you're not doing that. Um, and and nope. so it, it's something that's strong and powerful and comes in close to people's homes uh, and, and observes them and sometimes messes with them in a very negative way. Uh, and, and even with that story, what's interesting is the the cover up. And I don't know if you if you kind of go into that kind of stuff with the book, but uh, th- there does seem to be this idea that you know, uh, whether it's the law trying to cover it up or people who have the experience trying to cover it up because they don't want to be thought crazy. The, the guy who, who called 911 that night, he, he's on, he's on uh, record telling Ron Moorhead that this thing, when he says, oh, it's six foot nine, I don't know. It was actually, he said, closer to yeah. seven foot nine, but he knew that he wouldn't come if he said it was seven foot nine. Right. Um, I write in chapter 30, the whole thing is, how it's covered up really and and it opened the door for a sequel and i'm do you remember bob garrett oh yeah out in the thick the big big thicket thicket? yeah yeah well i was able to get a hold of his son i believe brandon and uh they we might they might take me out in the big thicket because it's about four hours from my place and so um I'm looking into sequels now that might involve the same sheriffs in other places. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. But the the general idea is that they have their ways of getting people to uh, forget about what they saw. <laughs> yeah. And uh and and that it's much bigger than 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 just um an animal. It's a part. I believe that mystery is part of a macro. It's a microcosm of a much bigger mystery. And when we understand the bigger mystery, that part will fit. But until we do, it won't. That's just my opinion. Yeah. Kind of what I've come to. I couldn't agree more. So really, uh, I, that's, that's a very, uh, accurate way of stating something that I feel inside. And, uh, I, I think we're, we're out here collecting puzzle pieces and, we're still trying yep. to figure out how this big picture is going to look, but we have this piece over here and this piece over here. And if we could just find that central piece, it would make everything make a lot more sense. Um, and I think, I think it's related to the fact that we're a very small planet in a small solar system, in a small galaxy of billions of other galaxies and trillions of other planets. And, there's been life on this thing for a long time <laughs> and it, it could have come from lots of different places. And so who there, there's way more that we don't know than what we do. Yes. So I think it's related to that. Although who I don't know the exact, <laughs> I just know something doesn't fit right. Even when you think about when Wes was talking about his experience and how the thing moved, and it just didn't move like something's supposed to move that's on this yeah. earth. It's just like beyond this earth. I think I've heard that a lot of different people say that in stories. And it's just too many things that are just mysterious and just don't fit. Absolutely. And uh, so I think it's part of a bigger picture. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree. Uh, and the, 
the way these things move, the, the different aspects that that kind of lead in that direction, I think sometimes uh, you almost have to put earmuffs on and pretend you didn't hear what you just heard in order to keep your train of thought with what you previously want to say Bigfoot is. Uh, Wes's yeah. you know, uh, famous question for his show for years uh, was, you know, what what do you think Bigfoot is, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you have anything that you've ever narrowed down to saying, you know, if I had to pick one, I think it's kind of in this direction. Um, you know how, you know how Superman is really strong here, uh, but on his own planet where the kryptonite existed, he was kind of he was normal. Yeah. Um, I wonder sometimes if something just brought these things here and dropped them off. Maybe they were a nuisance. I don't know. And said, uh, let's move them over to earth. And cause they seem to do things that violate gravity that, that they're stronger than they should be and faster than they should be. And they move quicker and in strange ways that they just shouldn't move if they had developed here on this planet with this gravity. So I often wonder, I don't know, I just am guessing, but if I had to put money on it, I'd probably say they're not entirely from this planet. They may have developed some sense and mixed maybe with other, with people, but that's kind of the place I go. Yeah. I, I, um, I go, I go in a little bit of that direction too, just in the sense that I don't think they're totally from here. I don't know if it's another planet, yeah. but I kind of get even more woo woo with it. And I'm like interdimensional beings, baby. <laughs> so Could be. I mean, Could be. I, I, listen, I, I, I don't claim to have the answers. I just am, um, maybe some would say foolish enough to share my thoughts publicly. So, uh, yeah. you know, I, I just, uh, I just share what I think. And, you know, if you listen to the entire show's history, you'll hear my thought process change and evolve over time. And it's just like, sure. yeah, you're coming, you're coming along with a life journey with me and you just get to see how it all unfolds mentally for me. Uh, I'd probably be a good case study one day when I'm all dead and gone to just see how my, my brain devolved. <laughs> so, uh, you know, yeah, a lot of things have changed for me. I mean, I remember initially wanting it to be captured or shot. I don't want anyone to shoot one now unless it's trying to hurt them. I don't care if anybody believes in it. <laughs> I think it's cool. And uh, I think it's, it's a part of, it's a mystery and life has to have mysteries. And um, I don't want to be killed by it, but I don't want to, but I don't want to see it killed for no reason. And I really don't think you can capture one alive. I just don't think it's possible. Um, unless maybe you have some elite military operation with, you know, like seals or something. I don't think it's possible to get one alive, but, um, I just want, I think we should leave them alone <laughs> unless they bother us, uh, aside from trying to learn about them. Uh, and, and I have no idea what they are. I'm only guessing when I mention another planet possibly. What changed in your mindset when it comes to how you view the outcome of these things? I mean, it sounds like you went from kill one to not kill one. What, what was that switch for you? Um, I can't tell you exactly when it happened, but it just, the more I learned, the more I realized it was a lot bigger. I used to think it was a flesh and blood animal. And then it came pretty clear to me if it was a flesh and blood animal purely and nothing else, then it doesn't really exist. It is a myth. Because a flesh and blood animal shouldn't be able to hide. We have gorillas in the zoo. We even have pandas in the zoo. There's no reason it wouldn't be in the zoo if it was just a flesh and blood animal. There's got to be more to it. And once I realized that there's more to it, I think I started giving it more room and letting it be, feeling like we should probably let it be. Unless it bothers, I mean, if it's taking people and eating them for lunch, then I obviously we have to do something about it, but those are pretty rare. Yeah. So I think that's when I started to just, and then I've heard some people say they need to have protection. And I think, I think they just need to be left alone. They're perfectly capable of protecting themselves. And, um, so I'm kind of in that 
live and let live now with them, if that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. And, you know, years ago before I, I either before I started podcasting or shortly after I started podcasting, uh, I kind of tackled this question with people uh, on my old YouTube channel. It doesn't even exist anymore. But um, it was the idea that why, so if, if the government knew Bigfoot existed, why not just tell us? And I, I kind of went down this, this thought process of what would it do to the psyche of people if they knew there was a monster in the woods? Well, some people would probably run from the woods, never go in the woods. Uh, and then there'd be some people who would engage the woods more because they want to see it. They want to have it. And when I say have it, I mean literally have it. I think that you, if the government came out and said, yes, Bigfoot's real, it is a physical creature, it is in the woods, it's very good at eluding human beings, and uh, you know, we, don't, we didn't want to talk about it because, uh, you know, whatever. Um, I think you'd have a chunk of people, a large chunk of people actually, going out there looking for it to make it a trophy. And if that happened... It does make you wonder what it would do to the psyche of these creatures in the woods then too. Uh, if you think that sometimes we have these rare cases where people go missing and things like that, that might become very, very common if the general census is when a human goes in the woods, they're looking to rack a Bigfoot. Those things are really good at hiding and maybe they just cut, they start popping people's necks while they walk by them like uh, little zits on a forehead, you know? <laughs> Yeah, you don't want that. No, no. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I go into. I explored all that at the end because uh, the sheriff was trying to answer those questions. And anyway, I don't want to give it away. But that all of those things are legit, and uh, we don't know what people, how people would react if they really did know. Um, and so. But I also think they're hiding something. I think they're hiding the bigger picture. And I don't, I think they're, I, I'm kind of skeptical when it comes to government. And I think they're pretty self serving. And there may be power dynamics that are preventing them from letting in on some of this because it does speak to a bigger picture that maybe they're a smaller part of than they want to be. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I I don't give too much credit to the, to the government, unfortunately, anymore. <laughs> so, I I think most people that listen to this show are in the same boat as you. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's just somewhat ridiculous. But anyway, what's being called aliens instead of balloons? So, um, so anyway, but I it could very well be that they're hiding it or keeping it from us for good reasons it's just harder for me to believe today yeah well totally understand that um so for, for people to uh to get the book they can find it on amazon is there anywhere else they can find this book i just it's right it's all on it's only amazon now uh they have a program that you have to go just with them in order to take advantage of so i thought that would be the best way to do it first and you can get to it by going to your Amazon account or, and type in the book, Tomato Fields, in my name. Uh, you might even get it just by And it's available on Kindle University and, and on the ebook and paperback. Okay. I look at it doing an audio book too. I, did, I wanted to see how well the book did itself. Yeah, people can uh, check out the book right now on Amazon. It's Tomato Fields. Uh, Fields. And the author is Tim Moon, M-O-O-N. And uh, this is a book, like I said in, in the beginning, that we, me and Lindsay, were aware of for years now. Uh, you've been working on it for quite some time. And I'm really excited that it's out now. And I'm really excited that you're getting great reviews. Uh, and you know, when I, when I have authors on the show, um, it, they always come back and say that our audience really likes reading because when they come on the show, they sell a lot of books. And I, I really hope people are oh, interested great. in this because um, it, it's it's really well written. And if you're looking for a good adult story about Bigfoot that is fictional, based off of a real happening, this is the book for you. Uh, now, Tim, you just told we just talked about Bigfoot. We talked about your brother's uh, encounter story and things like that. But 
uh, you have had uh, other uh, you know, experiences with the paranormal and, and things like that. And we've talked about, uh, we, I, clearly I had you on the show before, so we talked about things before. Uh, but tell me some of these experiences that you've had that maybe not Bigfoot, but the audience might be interested in hearing. Well, I've had um, a couple. I think the, when we were little kids, we lived in a house and we talked about that on the other program that had some kind of ghost. And we finally came to see it as a little child. My brother seen it uh, as a child. It followed my dad into the bathroom. And uh, and we heard it all the time. And it made noise downstairs, turned the dryer on, turned the stove on, moved pots and pans around, pans around at night. That's when I heard it was when it was moving pots and pans around. And the my, one time it elevated a mantle piece off of our mantle and floated out uh, and then dropped down on the fireplace and shattered. Um, and then my mom, I'm not big into Ouija board, so please no, I'm not endorsing this, but my mom did that when I was very young. She got a Ouija board and they, they tried to talk to this ghost that we thought was in the house. And they got what they were thought they thought were initials and so and that, that it has it had died. In, at, in the house so apparently she went down to the city and looked into it and told us that she found out a little boy had died in that house uh in the early part of its existence probably in the 30s my guess and 1930s and um and we just came to see it as a little bit kind of part of the family uh it was just something that everybody knew was there and didn't seem to bother anybody although it did scare my grandma pretty bad and uh and it was just a common thing when we left that house uh when i was in seventh grade nothing went with us so if it was there it stayed there so when you say it scared your grandmother pretty bad it was it like there was a situation that happened or was it just the fact that it was there scared your grandmother a lot well no she, she was in the room in the guest room and something was scratching underneath her bed and she got out of bed and looked underneath the bed and she thought it was our dog. And she looked under the bed and there was nothing there. And she thought she was just imagining something. So she went back to bed and it started again. And she, she got out again and it was looked and there was nothing there. And that was enough for her. She packed her bags and called a cab and waited in the front, wow. front room to leave. And I don't think she ever came back. Wow. And and uh, my aunt her my grandma's daughter and my mom's sister had an experience with it um i think it's something sat down on her bed and it and it it pushed down on the blanket and but she doesn't didn't seem to be scared of it so she was kind of like the rest of us initially i think everyone was a little scared of it but after a while it just became part of the family a distant part of it. Felt like we saw it every day, but but it was interesting. It was not malevolent to our knowledge, and it was it was not scary except that one instance that I know of. Aside from the mantelpiece floating off the mantel, I'm sure that scared everybody. I don't remember honestly seeing that, but my brother does vividly. So, um, I think that's kind of scary if you're not expecting it uh yeah yeah i i think that is scary for anybody whether you're expecting it or not uh it, yeah it's definitely scary i wonder what would have been more scary for your grandmother if she looks under the bed and there's nothing there or if she looks under the bed and there's a little boy looking back at her you know like <laughs> things could be worse well yeah it could be i uh either one of those aren't that great <laughs> options for me so yeah, uh, I, I can see why she was scared. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that is some of the paranormal stuff that happened in your in your house growing up. But I, I if I if I recall correctly, there's a UFO story you have, right? Well, I've I had one, but you know, kind of related related to that. Maybe I remember being at a Starbucks once uh, in Virginia, and I was just having a cup of coffee. I was doing something on my computer. And I heard these girls talking at the table next to me. And they were talking about using a Ouija board and having all these things start falling off 
the walls and pictures tilting and them being super scared, <laughs> really scared and not knowing what to do. And um, uh, by then I had a little bit more religious background. And uh, so I offered, well, I just tried to, to share uh, that, that the Ouija boards are not something you want to mess with. And I would get that out of your house as soon as possible. And, then encourage them to pray, use the Lord's prayer if things come back. But I know those things are real and they can create a lot of issues for people. And uh, I try to, I don't mess with them at all. I don't want them around me at all. So uh, I wanted to clarify that, that, that it's, it can be really bad when you play with that stuff. Yeah, that's what I hear. I never played with it myself, but uh, I was warned as a child not to touch it. My mother, um, she told me, don't ever touch those things. I think she's got probably experiences with it. Uh, but I remember walking through Kmart as a kid in the toy section. And I'm like, if these are so bad, why are they selling them as toys? You know, And it's just a, a cultural, I think, lack of belief of, of another realm, another sp- spiritual side of things. Um, I think generally speaking, we don't believe these things happen. And so... Oh, they happen. <laughs> yeah. Tell me. Yeah, I, I did play with it. I did play with it as a kid, and I did see it move. Nothing ever bad happened to me. And uh, after I became a Christian, I didn't want anything to do with it. And uh, so, but then I've heard subsequent stories since then that validate why I, <laughs> why I didn't want to have anything to do with it. Yeah. And so I just think you're messing with stuff that you probably aren't ready to handle. Even someone who is ready to handle that, um, wouldn't go looking for it. Um, people who dealt with demons and do it as a profession typically are reticent to go looking for them. They have sometimes they have to deal with them, but that's not because they want to or be around them. So anyway, that came up. So I wanted to share that. Um, one of the stories I do have is with my brother. Uh, is a diabetic or was a diabetic? He's he passed away a while a little while ago. And he, have you ever seen someone who's low blood sugar? Yes, my aunt was, yes. Okay, you get a little woozy, and sometimes you look like you've been drinking a lot. And sometimes people who are, have low blood sugar are, are, are thought to have been drunk. And, and, um, and, he looked, and he looked like that, and when I saw him like that, I knew his blood sugar because he'd been a diabetic since a child so i tried to get him to eat some or drink some coke and uh and maybe eat a little chocolate to try to get him back up to normal so we could talk and we were we were uh, talking i was just encouraging him basically to do that and it's hard to do it. you got to be persistent when they're in that state um and and he he would look up at me occasionally with it was kind of a scary, evil look in his eyes. Have you ever seen that where you'd wonder what is looking back at you? Uh, yeah, when I look in the mirror sometimes. <laughs> oh, other than that. <laughs> um, it was like that. He was look at, like some evil was looking back at me. And I thought, oh, it's just my imagination. What's going on here? This is ridiculous. And then I, he did it again. And I thought, Oh, this is ridiculous. I can't believe this is happening. And his girlfriend was in the other room. She was already scared just because of the physical condition. And But I fell inside. I needed to deal with it, the, the, the demon. And it looked at me one more time, and I just did it. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. And it looked at me, and I am not kidding you, Tony. It said to me, it does not belong to you. He does not belong to you. Wow. And I said, and I knew that it had nothing to do with me. And I just kept saying over and over and over in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. And I said it over and over. And then finally, it just, he just slumped down and then he lifted up and looked at me and said, what's going on? And his girlfriend was freaked. Yeah. And, uh, and I, and I said, and I, I, I couldn't explain it to him right then because it involved too much. I just got him some more, a little more sugar, and I made sure his blood sugar was right. And then I held held on to it until the next day when he and I were alone. 
in the laundry room. And then I explained what happened. And uh, at the time, I wasn't quite sure how to how to uh, interpret all of that. Still not sure I know exactly how. I do know, though, that it's very likely when you're under and you're a diabetic and you're you lose power because you've gone low blood sugar that you could that something could maybe get in and but i also know he lived a lifestyle that probably would have allowed something like that too Hmm. and so it's just i don't know but uh it did give me an opportunity to to share with him you know about spiritual truths and realities and i don't know what, what impact that had on him so but that scared that scared me a little uh and it shocked me a lot i just didn't expect that it came out of nowhere and it's never happened again since there was one time where i was in a church and in the basement of a church and this lady said she was possessed and these guys were trying to do an exorcism and the whole time I felt in my spirit that it wasn't true, that it was emotionalism, and she just wanted attention. And it didn't come to anything. There was never a result. I eventually left. Um, but so I think you can tell the difference between when it's real and not. Um, or at least at, for those two instances, I felt they were drastically different. Interesting. I hope I haven't shocked you or something. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. But I mean, that probably came out of nowhere. But it's it just was real. It really happened. No, it's fine. So, like, like you're not going to shock. Listen, I've been at this for six and a half years. You're not going to shock me on anything. Trust me. Okay, so, good. Uh, good, good, good. But um, no, it's interesting because I I recently have been feeling like uh, almost like a preparation. I guess is basically how it feels that I'm going to be transitioning in my personal life into um, having more demonic encounters. Uh, And I'm saying this publicly on recordings recently, partly uh, to help me kind of sort it all out in my brain because I I tend to sort things out better when I speak it, but also for the audience to hear. So if something were to start happening, they can be like, oh, he said that he felt like this was going to start happening, you know? Um, yeah, but I, I do, and I don't know why, but I just feel like, uh, there, I don't want to say I'm being prepared, but I I just feel like there's going to become a season in my life where I'm going to be dealing more with the demonic realm in a very up close and personal way, not with the show, not with people's stories, but kind of in your face kind of thing. And I I don't know what that's going to look like and why. That is the case, but uh, well, I got some, I got some ideas as to why. But um, it, it's it's going to be an interesting ride if it starts happening because I think I, I'm for the first time in my life. I think I'm prepared as much as you can be prepared uh, mentally to engage that realm. Uh, I think I'm, mm-hmm. I'm I'm ready spiritually, and uh, I'm very very fearless. I've been fearless for a very long time, and I think. It's. I'm finally at the point where everything's kind of merging together. The fearlessness, the mental readiness, um, even the time-wise. Like, uh, I don't think I would have been able to focus in on it as much if I was still driving a tractor trailer, you know. Uh, but yeah. I'm in charge of my sure. own schedule, and I can, I can kind of zero in on things that need to be zeroed in on. I remember, I remember when you had that show where you told the story of that guy who wanted you to come over to his house that you knew at work, I think. Yeah. And it turned out to have demon stuff all over the walls and everything. And you felt that he was pulling you into some kind of trap. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I remember it very clearly. And I remember thinking that was very, that was a dangerous situation. And I remember asking you, I think I said, uh, just be careful. Are you maybe? be prayed up or something. I don't remember exactly how I said, but you felt pretty comfortable that you were okay dealing with stuff like that. So I was, I was kind of impressed that you had the confidence you had. And so you don't surprise me when you say this. Yeah. You know, for me, it's really, um, my source of confidence comes from how I got here. Uh, I, I, I truly, truly, truly believe that I was placed here by God. 
There's a reason why I'm doing this show. There's a reason why I have the interest yeah. in these topics. And when you come from a, a psychological aspect like that, where you in your heart believe and mentally believe you were placed here for a purpose by something that's more powerful than any demon could be, you kind of walk with a swagger. You kind of walk with, a, and at times it can be arrogance where it's like, I'm untouchable. You can't touch me unless God wills it. And if God wills it, so be it because I know he, I'm in his hand. So like we, like we, yeah. and that's kind of the attitude I have right now in the sense it's like, if I have, if I have experiences are coming across my path where I'm encountering demonically possessed people or demons are manifesting in front of me, so be it. Because I feel like I'm surfing the hand of God in my life. And so if God wills it, then let's go. Yeah. You know, because there's something. Well, that's how it came across. That's how it came across. It didn't come across as an arrogant thing to me. Because cool. if, if it comes across as arrogant and someone's messing with stuff like that, they're in for a big shock. Oh, yeah. And, uh, uh, but that's not how it came across to me. So who knows? That might very well happen. So, I mean, if, if it does, it does. I mean, I'm not looking forward to it. I'm not looking, f right. I'm not looking for it to happen. Uh, but I just, right. I just, and maybe that's why, uh, I don't know. I, I just, I, I just feel like if it happens, it happens and we'll, we'll, we'll handle it. And, uh, I, yeah. and, and part of me part of me has uh, an, an anticipation towards it, uh, not a good or bad, just an, an anticipation where it's like, kind of want to see how this all unfolds just so that um, I, I grow. I think it'll be a, a big uh, growing experience for me as a human being, as a person, an individual, a husband, a father, uh, as a Christian, uh, a spiritual leader, yeah. all that. I think it's going to be a huge growing experience. So uh, I'm not putting it out into the ether and trying to attract it to happen right now by talking about it last five minutes, but uh, it, it's just... No, but it's, it's interesting though. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it, it's certainly interesting, but um, I, we'll, we'll see what happens. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm completely wrong and I'll, I'll live a very dull and boring life from here forward. I, I, I kind of, I kind of hope not though. So <laughs> the, the Chinese, when they don't like you, they they wish you an interesting life <laughs> really <laughs> yes if someone ever says i hope you have an interesting life it's not because they like you <laughs> 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 that's so funny so, if i ever hear a chinese person say that to me i'm like you jerk <laughs> <laughs> oh. most most americans would say what a compliment what a nice man yeah thank but you that's not what that's probably not what they mean that's so, that's funny. I'm, I bet I'm going to get an email funny. now that the subject line is going to be, I hope you have an interesting life. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Oh man, that's funny. But anyway, it's a proverb or some kind of Chinese proverb. I'm, so I I can't remember where I heard it, but it, it stuck with me when I heard it. So That's cool. Um, the only other thing, Tony, that ever happened was a UFO experience. And uh it's only UFO because I don't know what it was, but it was one of those triangles and it was like 40 years ago. And it was, I came out of a concert in Washington state and, and was my friends and I looked up and we saw this dark triangle that was moving around in the sky in geometric form. And the only reason we noticed it is because it was a little lighter shade of dark than the sky that it was in. And we watched it move in like little squares and triangles within a particular area for oh maybe 10 minutes and it just kept doing the same thing and we couldn't figure out what it was it was probably uh, about the the height of a uh, maybe a small airplane maybe a little higher um it's hard to tell because we don't know the reference point we had no way of determining how large it was but it was very unusual and then when all this triangle stuff started coming out recently um, I thought, well, that might have been what we saw. And so I called a friend and said, do you remember that? And she remembered it still. And so maybe we saw the early rendition of those triangles that now are becoming widely seen yeah. and more public. But at the time, we, knew, we didn't have a clue. We'd never seen anything like it. Yeah. And there was no lights on it at all. None. So I have no idea what that was. It's wild, man. It's wild. Uh, I know the TR three B is a military uh, classification or class. I, I don't know if it's classified now. 
because I know about it. Uh, the the TR three B is a, a craft that's triangle. It has three lights in the bottom. I filmed one. I believe I filmed one in uh, Utah, uh, and that's on the film uh, The Shape of Shadows that we're coming out with this summer. Um, uh-huh. and, and it's uh, it's interesting that you, you know you say there was no lights and stuff, but the idea of an early rendition. Uh, is really interesting. Does that mean does that mean that you feel like it's uh, more man made? I don't know. To be honest with you, I would go. I could go either way. Um, and I've heard since uh, recently, actually, that when when they use some of the kind of cloaking devices that they supposedly have, that it just that they're not completely invisible, but they're they're very hard to see. And I'm just wondering if maybe that thing was cloaked, and that's why. We barely saw it, but it was clear. I mean, it was just because it was a little lighter than the night sky around it. I don't know. It, um, if we had stuff back then like that, <laughs> just imagine what we have today. Exactly. Exactly. And, and so when they say they shot down a, a UFO, I just, not unless the UFO was drinking. Because <laughs> they're just too far ahead of us. They're too far ahead of us. We're not going to shoot it down. It's just not going to happen. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, but that's my, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we shoot three down in one day. and That's pretty common, but that was cynicism. Sure. Uh, I, I, it might, it might be that we're shooting down the uh, balloon UFOs though. Cause the, you know, they're saying we're shooting yeah, it down could balloons. Be that. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I, I yeah. understand. I mean, the, and it all, I guess it all kind of stems from, you know, what do you personally feel like these things originally are? Uh, because if it is man-made, then it would make sense that we're able to shoot them down because we made them, so we should have the ability to do that. Uh, but if it's not right. man-made, then it seems like we are, we are behind in technology because if, if we weren't, if we were more advanced than what we're seeing in the sky and that's not man-made, we should have the ability to, uh, to take care of business. Um, so I, it, it's interesting to, to think about. And I, I, one thing's for sure. I kind of agree with you. Uh, if they say it, I tend not to believe it. So <laughs> yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of where I am. Yeah. So, well, I, I appreciate you coming on and, and talking about the book and some of your hey, experiences here. Thanks, Tony. I appreciate you, you allowing me on. It was a pleasure. 